Welcome to another episode of United for a Healthy Stoughton. And today we are here with a local police officer from the Stoughton Police Department, Nathan Derby, and he is a drug recognition expert. So we thought we would spend some time today learning about what that means, what drug recognition experts are, and why we are fortunate to have one in our community contributing to all of the wonderful things that we have going on here. So welcome. Thank you for having Thanks me. Thanks for coming to the show today. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and um, sort of where you come from and how long you've been on with the Stoughton Police? So I'm a uh, been a police officer since 2008. I started my career with the uh, Wellesley Police Department. I was there for about seven years. And then in October of 2015, I had the opportunity to come to Stoughton, which is where I've been living the whole time. So I uh, jumped on that opportunity and uh, been happy since then. Excellent. Great. Yep. So you're a resident I am. as well. I am. Awesome. So tell us a little bit about what it means to be a drug recognition expert and some of the history of that program here in Massachusetts. So the, the drug recognition expert program actually originated with the Los Angeles Police Department. Mm -hmm. There was a handful of officers that were uh, finding issues with operators that were impaired when they're driving, but not with alcohol. So they developed this system. Uh, it was it was validated with a couple of scientific research studies and then spread across the, uh, the United States mm -hmm. and uh, eventually to Massachusetts. And uh, as of today, I looked at the Massachusetts DRE website and there's approximately 120 DREs in the state of Massachusetts. Great. And about 4,000 nationwide. Excellent. So that means we do, there are not DREs in every police department. No. 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 So there's, we're lucky to have one in our police department. <laughs> yes, it is, it's a, definitely a benefit for departments to have a DRE mm -hmm. uh, on call for them. Excellent. So tell us a little bit about what that means. Like, what does a DRE do? And So a DRE, uh, it, it, which stands for Drug uh, Recognition Expert, um, when a person is placed under arrest for operating under the influence of drugs, mm -hmm. that person is brought back to the police station, and then they call and uh, ask for a DRE to come out. And the DRE does a 12-step evaluation to determine what categories of drugs that person is impaired by. Hmm. And so you go through that whole process, and at the end, you form an opinion as to the drug category. Okay. So um, what kinds of training did you have to receive in order to do this? It seems like that's a, that's a lot of testing to be doing with an individual. It, it is. It's actually a... Uh, it's actually a, a pretty intense uh, training program. I've been fortunate to go to a, a good amount of training in my career, mm -hmm. but that was by far the, uh, the most uh, rigorous program that I've, I've taken part in. Um, you have to meet a few prerequisites to even get into the program. Mm -hmm. You have to be a police officer for a minimum of two years. Mm -hmm. You have to be uh, very versed um, in dealing with operating under the influence, both in the, the arrest part of it and then also um, testifying in court. Um, and then you have to take a, a two-day prerequisite class and if you meet all those requirements, then you can apply to be accepted to the program. Mm -hmm. uh, and then once you're in the program, uh, it's a uh, two-week program. Um, it's about eight, eight to five every day, mm. um, a lot of testing. Um, and when you complete that program, the two weeks, then you actually have to do 12 supervised um, uh, field evaluations. Mm -hmm. And typically, for Massachusetts officers, that's done by going out to Maricopa County, Arizona, to the uh, Maricopa County Jail, hmm. and you do the evaluations actually in the jail of prisoners who have been brought in who are waiting to different parts of the justice system. They volunteer to participate, and we do the evaluations on them. Oh, interesting. So in most cases, folks have to travel out somewhere else to in order to get all of those evaluations in. Yes, just because there's they've tried doing it at like... Uh, when certain bands come to like uh, oh, right. Mansfield or whatever bands that may have a following that mm -hmm. tends to like drugs, but they don't always get a consistent amount. Mm -hmm. But uh, Maricopa County, the way it works out there when you're arrested, instead of being transported to a police station, you go to a central jail. Mm -hmm. So the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office does between 800 and 1,000 intakes a day. Wow. So it's just van load after van load of prisoners are coming in. Mm -hmm. And a good number of those people are under the influence of some sort of drug. Okay. Um, the instructors do some preliminary testing to make sure that they're actually impaired, mm -hmm. and then um, they they kind of they get some. Uh, they don't go into general population. They stay with us. They get some snacks and drinks, mm -hmm. and so there's a benefit to them to participating mm -hmm. in, in the program. And uh, we do the evaluations. Um, you have to uh, you have to do the evaluation prior to us doing the evaluation out there. The uh, 
the instructors have actually taken a urine sample from those people, so they mm -hmm. actually have an idea of what drugs oh. are in the system. So mm -hmm. it's not just us guessing. They're, they're matching what we say in our evaluation with what they've actually seen in the, the preliminary tox screen. Mm -hmm. So you have to get you have to actually get what's in the, the their system. You can't just wildly guess. And, right. Uh, so once you've done that whole program, you take a, a final knowledge exam, um, which is uh, just some written questions. You have to do some mock evaluations. It took me about six hours to finish the actual final knowledge wow. exam. So it's a pretty rigorous program. Yep. Yep. So the testing really does allow you to be kind of to come up with an evaluation that is really close to what they might be able to find out with a talk screen. Yes. I mean, that, that's the goal. I mean, yep. we want to, we want to I'd correctly identify what substance the person is on. Mm -hmm. um, and then ideally either in training or in actual an enforcement evaluation is to get a urine sample and then match what you've seen with what they're actually on. Mm -hmm. Now I'm, I'm sure folks who are watching this are wondering, so why don't we just do urine samples in the first place or take blood from people? For uh, for all to evaluate if somebody if you thought if you suspected somebody was under the influence of drugs why wouldn't we why wouldn't a police department just do that? Um, because we can ask you to do it, mm -hmm. we can't compel you to do it. Okay. Um, the way the laws are written in Massachusetts, if we ask you to take a breath test mm -hmm. at the police station yep. and you don't do that, there's ramifications mm -hmm. as far as your license being suspended. Right. But the way the law is written in Massachusetts. If you refuse to, to participate in the DRE program mm -hmm. or the evaluation or give a urine sample at the end of it, uh, there's, there's very little that we can do, unfortunately. Mm. Um, other states have, um, New Hampshire specifically nearby, has mm -hmm. changed their laws to more uh, make the DRE program uh, more strictly enforced. Mm -hmm. um, if, you, if you refuse to participate there, I think it's treated pretty much the same way as a breath test refusal is here in Massachusetts. Okay. Yeah. So that actually, so that sort of falls into one of my next questions, which was really how is operating under the influence of drugs different than OUI alcohol? And so one of the differences has to do with um, some of the laws around police enforcement. Y yes in and some no. Ways, right. In some ways. Um, the law, the law, basically there's, it's under chapter 90, section 24, mm -hmm. the Mass General Laws is where OUI drugs and OUI alcohol both fall under. Uh, the penalties are the same. Mm -hmm. um, the right of arrest is the same. It's just more an issue of most officers are clearly know what a, a drunk driver looks like. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's some pretty common signs, uh, typically slurred speech, right. bloodshot and glassy eyes, odor of alcohol. Um, where it differs with, with drugs is they don't always present the same way. Mm -hmm. Their driving might be equally as bad mm -hmm. as someone that's impaired by alcohol, but then when you talk to them, they may talk to you fine and converse with you, and it's not until they actually do the field sobriety test that you see the, the, the impairment. Mm -hmm. So there, it's, it's, more of a, uh, it's more of just an education issue with getting the, the average patrol officer educated on what to look for when it mm -hmm. comes to drug impaired driving. So can you give some examples of what, what are some of the tests or the, some of the things you look for? Or, we, or is that something no, that... No, that's fine. Okay. Um, so it, basically you're just looking for anything, I hate to say the word that's not normal, mm -hmm. but I mean, when you're a police officer, you interact with people all, all the time. Right. So you kind of have a baseline of, of what the average person is when, the, when you, how their behavior is when you deal with the line of traffic mm -hmm. stop. So you start to look for things that are outside of that kind of norm that you've established based on your years of experience. Mm -hmm. So, um, like I said, for alcohol, it's the bloodshot and glassy mm -hmm. eyes, the slurred speech, the odor of alcohol. That's the minimum you need to have to make an arrest for operating under the influence of alcohol. When it comes to drugs, you're looking for uh, indications with their eyes, whether their eyes are, are, are constricted or, mm -hmm. or dilated. Um, you can also look for their speech, whether it's slow, whether it's slurred, whether it's uh, way faster than it should be. Mm -hmm. And then um, whether they're sweating, you know, all those sort of things you can, you're looking for. And then the field sobriety testing roadside is the same for operating under the influence of alcohol or drugs. It's okay. the, uh, the, the standard um, is the nine-step walk and turn, mm -hmm. the one-legged stand, mm -hmm. and then the horizontal gaze nystagmus test. Mm -hmm. And that's typically, most officers do those three tests, and then there are other tests that officers can do, but those three have been scientifically validated. So can you explain that last one? Because I'm guessing most folks at home are going to go the horizontal what test yeah. now? <laughs> so horizontal gaze nystagmus, um, alcohol, and then certain categories of drugs mm -hmm. will cause your eyes to have 
a nystagmus, which a nystagmus is a scientific term for an involuntary jerking of the hmm. eyes. Okay. So that's when you see the officer actually hold the finger out or a yep. pin out in front of them and say, follow my finger. Mm -hmm. uh, th when, you're, when they do that, what you're looking for is the eyes to have what we call uh, lack of smooth pursuit. Mm -hmm. like if I did that exam to you right now, your eyes would follow right. my finger smoothly, but when, um, when you're impaired on certain categories of drugs or alcohol, your eyes kind of move up. They, they move, it breaks, it doesn't okay. follow smoothly. So they might like go and then come back kind of? Yeah, it's more like they'll, they'll continue to follow it, but it's their eye goes like this along. Huh. Okay. Um, and then, so that's a lack of smooth pursuit. And then you're also looking for um, what they call nystagmus at maximum deviation. So when you actually hold your finger to a 45 degree angle mm -hmm. to their eyes, that eye um, will, will continue to bounce huh. when it's over there if the person's impaired on, on alcohol and mm -hmm. certain categories of drugs. Okay. Um, and then the earlier that it starts to bounce like that, the uh, more impaired the person is. Oh, interesting. So we're looking for those three, uh, mm -hmm. th three things with uh, the horizontal gaze nystagmus test. Okay. Which, and it's actually a very, uh, especially for alcohol, uh, a very um, reliable indicator mm -hmm. of impairment. Okay. And then you had said, so then you, if somebody were to fail some of those tests, you would take them back to the station and you would continue an evaluation. So it, de it depends. Mm. Um, if it's, if it's just an OUI alcohol, yep. typically that's, that would be where the evaluation would end. Mm -hmm. Back at the station, they would be asked to submit to a, a breath test mm -hmm. to confirm that they were um, under the influence. And that's where, like I said, if they refuse there, um, there are some ramifications right. legally. Yep. Um, if they're on, o if it's, if they believe that they're on drugs mm -hmm. and that's what they're impaired by, that's the point in which time you would call for the DRE to come out and do that evaluation mm -hmm. actually at the station. Okay. And so what happens for, so we're lucky in Stoughton because we have somebody in the department so they can call you yes. and you're in Stoughton. Yes. What happens for other police departments who are not that fortunate? Um, on the Massachusetts DRE website, mm -hmm. there's actually a list of all the active DREs in the state. Mm -hmm. So you can, any police department that does not have a DRE uh, internal to their police department can call any uh, any of those people on that list mm -hmm. and request that they come out. Oh, okay. Um, we're we're fortunate that that uh, that we have myself here in Stoughton, mm -hmm. but of all the surrounding towns, I don't believe they have any uh, DRE. So I do get called out um, frequently. I was asked to come out to Bridgewater recently, mm -hmm. East Bridgewater. Um, I've gone to Sharon. Mm -hmm. I've gone as far away as Ashland. Wow. So basically anybody who needs DRE support can get that just by going to the website and, and calling. Mm -hmm. And if the local departments don't have it, the state police actually has a, a big contingent of DREs and oh, they're okay. spread throughout the Commonwealth as oh, well. So that's good. Yes. So other departments can take advantage of that. Yes. Or if you, so if you were tied up in Stoughton, which I imagine probably happens. It does happen. Yep. <laughs> I try to be as, as available as I possibly can, mm -hmm. um, but sometimes it just life gets in the way of right. that. Right, yep. yep. And so we were talking a little bit about um, you were talking about the law and, and sort of when folks, particularly um, when they're under the influence of alcohol, they come back to the police department and there are specific legal ramifications for refusing a breathalyzer. And I know that there's, we've been thinking a lot about the marijuana law here in Stoughton and across the Commonwealth. And it's sort of, hopefully it's up for some changes um, and some recommendations. And I know police departments in particular have been trying to work with the legislature around tightening up some of those I guess, you know, a loophole basically that would allow police officers some more ability to have folks submit to some of those, the testing. And um, so can you talk a little bit about, because I think there's a misnomer that, well, if, I, if I'm high on marijuana, I'm a better driver than I am under the influence of alcohol or other drugs. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, unfortunately, there's a, uh, a perception among, uh, among people who, not among all, I'm sure there's actually are responsible people who smoke marijuana, but among many in who, who use marijuana, mm -hmm. that there's this perception that I do X, Y, or Z better when mm -hmm. I'm high. Mm -hmm. And scientific research has proven that that's just not true. Right. Um, and, and unfortunately, with that mindset, and especially among uh, younger uh, marijuana consumers, there's this idea that I can smoke and drive, mm -hmm. and, and it's, it's definitely causing problems. Whereas I think society in general pretty much recognizes that you can be a responsible uh, consumer of alcohol and you know you drink when you're at a party, when you have a designated driver, or when you're at home, but you don't go to work intoxicated. Mm -hmm. You don't go to, uh, you don't hop behind the wheel after having a couple of glasses of wine or a few beers. But that is kind of 
it's the reverse mindset I see mm -hmm. frequently with marijuana users, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Right, yep, and we, we actually we see it with our youth data too. So when we survey students and we ask them if they've been in a car with somebody who's been under the influence of alcohol or marijuana, m more um, often than, um, than with the alcohol, we hear about marijuana. And then for those who can drive, they're reporting more driving under the influence of marijuana than alcohol. And especially for the under 21 mm -hmm. uh, consumers of marijuana, they typically can get marijuana um, much easier than they can get um, uh, alcohol. Because mm -hmm. alcohol, you have to have an ID. Yep. Go into a liquor store, you have to convince someone who does have an ID to purchase the alcohol for you. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you have somebody you know who is a dealer, which there are plenty of, mm -hmm. um, it's you know you just have to have money and a, and a dealer's phone number, and typically you right. can procure marijuana. Right, right. So that's definitely that's been a challenge for us. I think both trying to teach people that it is equally dangerous, and in fact, we lost a state trooper in an um, yeah, accident where trooper the Clardy, yeah. yeah, who was uh, the driver was allegedly under the influence of yes. marijuana. I would hope that as it seems that the trend is that marijuana is going to become more legalized. Uh, not only in the, in the state of Massachusetts, mm -hmm. but nationwide, that there would be some education programs mm -hmm. that would begin to target the, uh, the youth of America and begin to explain to them that, you know, although, yes, you can at certain ages begin to use marijuana, it's not something that enhances your performance, it degrades mm -hmm. your performance. Mm -hmm. And some, edu some education campaigns, I think, would go a long way yep. in, in educating the population mm -hmm. as to as to the facts that are the truth about marijuana. Right. And I would also hope that the proponents of marijuana legalization would kind of uh, embrace that mm -hmm. embrace that message and be responsible mm -hmm. in their uh, advocacy for marijuana rights. Right, right. That this is a piece. It, it's the same with alcohol. Yes. It, you know, if yeah. somebody is using responsibly in and they're an adult and they are in their own home, that it's not having an impact on others. But yes. when you get behind the wheel of a car, yeah. you're you're talking about exactly. That. Yep. So do you, as an officer, do you notice, are there different erratic driving patterns between people who are OUI alcohol and marijuana? Because I had heard, one of the things I had read about was there was a study that said folks who are high, one of the things they tend to do is they tend to deviate into other lanes and that that's a different pattern of behavior than alcohol. I don't know if that's true. The best thing I can say when it comes to like uh, driving behaviors of impaired operators mm -hmm. is, is it depends. Hmm. Um, hmm. That... Alcohol and drugs affect everybody's body differently. Yep. Um, there are some people that they they you know are, are professional alcoholics basically, mm -hmm. and they their blood alcohol content can be very very high. But when you talk to them, you would hardly notice that they were impaired. Right. right? Maybe other than the alcohol, and they may be able. You would still see erratic operating, mm -hmm. but maybe it's not as is uh, pronounced as you would see if it was a, a 18 year old. Mm -hmm. who just started drinking alcohol, you know, and doesn't have that high tolerance. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing for drugs. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it depends on the, the person. Mm -hmm. um, I can't say that one drug is going to make someone swerve out of their lane versus a different sort of drug. Mm -hmm. um, but I think common across, the, common across um, any drug or alcohol that impairs you, you a lot of times see uh, lane violations, mm -hmm. um, rolling stops, um, following too closely, Mm -hmm. uh, abrupt turns, you know, just just because the the person is trying to, they're trying to do too much, and their brain is slowed mm -hmm. down or impaired by the alcohol or, or drugs, and so they just they start to make they just they present as very bad drivers mm -hmm. typically. Okay, yeah, it's interesting. And I I was um, years ago I used to teach some of this stuff to college students, and we used to always talk about like you forget after you've been driving for a while, particularly how complicated a behavior driving actually really is, and all the things that your brain has to focus on, so that you throw in something that's impairing you, and and I think it makes absolute sense that yeah. the behavior they well, would become a bad driver. They couldn't. They keep, you can't sort of keep track of everything that's happening at that speed. Yes, I mean in the same sense when you see drivers on their cell phones or adjusting mm -hmm. the radio or or talking to their kids in the car mm -hmm. or whatever it is that they're doing, um, driving is a um, it's it, it's splitting your attention, mm -hmm. um, and and so. Just on a, a good day, yep. you have a lot to concentrate on as a as a driver, um, and then when you throw alcohol or drugs into the mix, it definitely makes mm -hmm. your your brain have to work even harder, and that's why we start to see the the poor driving. Mm -hmm. And and so driving is a divided attention yep. uh, divided attention activity, and that's why the tests that we do for field sobriety testing are divided attention tests. Typically, mm. they have to balance 
and count or, or they have to follow the instructions we have mm -hmm. while they're doing other things and, and it starts to show that impairment okay so we can see those signs to assess yes how well they are, they're doing with that divided yes. attention piece yeah mm -hmm. and then you know i always think about then you throw in something unexpected that happens with a driver so that would challenge even sort of the best of us you know the an unexpected car stopping yeah. or a child running across the street that um and we know that a lot of drugs and alcohol delay reaction time yes you know, and unfortunately, that's where you see some of these, you know, um, fatal pedestrian mm -hmm. accidents and, and and things like that, or really bad car crashes. Is like you said, the the brain is is impaired, mm -hmm. and so it takes longer for it to perceive the problem, right. and then formulate a, a plan on how to deal with it. And oftentimes, by the time that's happened, mm -hmm. the the collision has already has already happened, right. and the damage is done. Right. Now, what about drugs that people are taking for prescription, like prescription medication? So somebody's had a surgery, the doctor prescribes something, same, similar issues under the influence, right? It, it is. And, and I've actually seen that a few times where the people have been impaired um, on prescription medication. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they say, well, this is prescribed to me. I mm -hmm. don't understand how come I'm under arrest or why this is happening to me. And, you know, all, all those pills that you take, for the most part, if you look at the container, mm -hmm. it says, you know, use caution when operating heavy, you know, heavy equipment or driving, you know, alcohol can increase the, uh, the effects. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people just think because it's been prescribed to them that they're okay to take it. Mm -hmm. um, and then sometimes also they may be prescribed to whatever drug they have is prescribed to them, but they're taking more than the prescribed dose because they like the effects that mm -hmm. that 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 prescription medication is giving them. Right, so being impaired has not, is not necessarily related. It doesn't help you if the medicine was your medicine. If the if people really need to be paying attention to all of those warnings on the bottle, it's no joke if it says do not operate under the influence. A absolutely, I mean, yeah, especially if it's, uh, you know, if you've recently been injured and, mm -hmm. and now they've given you some pain medication that you've, you're not used to taking, mm -hmm. just like I said before, the tolerance for that's going to be very low. So that person is probably going to be much more impaired quickly mm -hmm. than someone that maybe have been using it for a longer time. Right. So we have about five minutes left. So why don't you share with us some of the other, are there other challenges that sort of come with the territory of being a drug recognition expert or things that, that um, you think about kind of as you're doing your daily routine? Sure. Um, some of the challenges are um, being a DRE is not a proactive mm -hmm. job. It's, mm -hmm. it's reactive. When other officers have made an arrest, you come in and do the evaluation. Mm -hmm. So one of the, the bigger challenges is educating your average patrol officer or average police officer on what to look for when it comes to drug impaired driving. Mm -hmm. Just like I said, you might pull the car over for the erratic operation, but then when you engage the person in conversation, you might not notice the uh, the impairment. It's it's when you actually pull them out of the car and do mm -hmm. the field sobriety test. And some officers don't have that level of education right now, mm -hmm. um, so they kind of write it off as maybe the person is just on the radio or, or, or playing with their phone and, mm -hmm. and they let them go. Um, unfortunately, just because not because the officers do anything wrong, they just haven't been educated mm -hmm. in the signs and symptoms of drug impaired driving. So that's something that that going forward. Uh, would be helpful as a DRE because mm -hmm. the more arrests that are made, the more opportunity I have to come in and uh, to do to do what I do. Mm -hmm. And then uh, on the the prosecution end of it at, in the court system, um, it, it's difficult because it's it's a lot it's a, it's a lot of information to be a DRE. Mm -hmm. And then you have assistant district attorneys who are already overworked mm -hmm. and have a huge caseload, and now you're throwing in a lot of scientific jargon. A lot of, some of them don't know how to actually help the prosecution because mm. it almost overwhelms them. Yeah. Um, however, we're very fortunate in Norfolk County, um, District Attorney Morrissey mm -hmm. has been very, uh, has been very um, proactive with the DRE program and has actually sent some of his ADAs through the program. Mm. So, so that has been helpful in Norfolk County, but when I go to other counties, it, it's difficult. Right, yeah, yeah, we are very lucky. Our district attorney folks has, spends a lot of time focusing yes. on prevention as well, yes. so that hopefully there are less folks on the road under the influence, yeah. um, both um, in terms of alcohol and operating under the influence of other drugs. I yes. know that um, we do a lot of work with one of the ADAs as well, our coalition, and, um, and really trying to kind of get out in front of this, like you were saying, and doing some of that preventative work Yes. so that hopefully we don't need you as much on the road because there aren't as many of those folks engaging that behavior. But and certainly, that's ultimately the goal is yeah. to, to eliminate that behavior. Yep. But certainly we, we need the tools for yes. um, when that happens yes. so that we can keep everybody safe, including the folks who are operating under the influence. Yes. Um, 
So any other, do you have any other final thoughts or um, things that you want to share with the folks at home who might be watching this? And um, As far as the folks at home, I mean, just to, if you see a, uh, someone that's operating in, in a way that you think is uh, erratic or unsafe, um, call 911 and let the police know. Because a mm -hmm. lot of our OUI arrests do come in from uh, second or third party callers mm. that are happen to be on the highway or driving around town and they, they tell us, hey, this guy's all over the road, mm -hmm. he's going to kill somebody, we need an officer here. And yep. a lot of our OUI arrests do originate from uh, the public's help. Just yep. like in general, the police need the public's help to, to give us information. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, if you, if you see an operator that you feel is unsafe, uh, give us a call, give us as much information about your location and uh, the vehicle's information, and we'll do our best to uh, get there and uh, and try and stop that vehicle. Sometimes it's just as simple, like I said, someone's playing on their phone mm -hmm. or if they're distracted, but uh, oftentimes it does actually end up being a, a impaired operator. So what other advice would you give to those folks? Who, so I, if I'm driving down 138 and I see somebody acting erratically, should I, so I should call you, but should I be following them so that I can tell you, like, what are some other safety tips that you should give for the individual who is reaching out to you to say, let's well, keep an eye on this driver? I mean, if the person's operating erratically, I mean, you want to give yourself enough of a standoff dif distance mm -hmm. so that if the person stops abruptly, right. that you're not involved in an accident. Um, but, you know, and if, if you can follow them, that's obviously helpful. Sometimes we get calls and then the person turns, the, right. the reporting party turns because they're, you know, they're going about their daily life mm -hmm. and then we lose, we lose sight of that right. person. Um, so if you can follow the person, that's helpful. Uh, license plate numbers are always uh, hugely helpful. Mm. Vehicle descriptions, uh, what exactly it is that they're doing. Yep. Um, and then oftentimes if you provide your information to the police, it, it makes it easier for us in court that we have an identified um, witness as oh, to right. who called it in. Yep. And then sometimes we'll ask um, the operator of the reporting party to do, um, especially if there's a lot of traffic, would be to put their hazard lights on. Mm -hmm. So that way it just makes it a little bit easier for the police officer when he's coming up to see, oh, the reporting party is in a white Nissan and they have their hazards mm -hmm. on. So now you know, I see the white Nissan, I see the hazard, yep. the car right the in car front of it is the one there. I'm looking for. Excellent. Great. So. Well, thank you so much for all your time today. We've come to the end of our show. I know that hopefully that felt quick to you. <laughs> it did. Um, yeah, sometimes that 30 minutes flies by. So thank you so much. We really, we appreciate all the work that you do specifically that the Stoughton Police Department does in our community. Um, we're very fortunate. We have a very proactive police department um, and you guys are really doing some excellent work. So thanks again for joining me today. Thank you for having me. All right.